Hey med geekers, Caitlin here. And for this week's episode, I want to talk about heat stroke. Um, I had an exciting beginning to my night shift last week. Um, a patient came in with the sliced open radial artery, so we had to handle that really quickly. I'm talking, I walked in the door and that happened. And then all of a sudden a nurse is coming to get me and she's saying another patient just came in um, with like 104 degree temperature. And I was like, oh my goodness. But she said I was in the presence of heat stroke. So I was like, okay. So we got a bunch of ice packs, a fan, and cooling spray, and we began cooling this guy. And afterwards, the workup and the treatment for heat stroke was a lot different than I thought it would be. So I wanted to make a video on it and review it. So let's get started. So just to give you a little overview of heat strokes, there are two types. There's exertional and then there's non-exertional. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Exertional happens fairly quickly upon exertion. Um, usually you can see this in marathon runners or um, soccer players playing in the heat, uh, football players, especially with all their padding. And then there's non-exertional, and this one seems to be more insidious um, onset. And the population of people who you can't really tell, or they can't really tell how hot their body is, so children and elderly are definitely more prone to the non-exertional type, and it's definitely has a high mortality rate. Um, these patients tend to have a temperature over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and this temperature is just um, unlikely to be infectious once it's over 104. The most common causes of a temperature that's over 104 are um, heat stroke, neurolactic malignant syndrome, and then malignant hyperthermia. So just keep that in mind when you have a temperature over 104 um, to look for other causes other than infectious. When it comes to the symptoms of heat stroke, um, there's the obvious symptom of having a temperature over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and then um, you're going to have symptoms related to possible complications. Um, so these patients could develop cerebral edema, which can present as confusion, altered mental status, seizures, um, or ataxia. Um, they can get um, pulmonary edema, so they may be complaining of um, some shortness of breath, chest pain. Um, and then these patients can have just a decrease in the amount of urine, so they're saying their urine looks very dark. Um, and even hematochesia from sometimes these patients can get intestinal ischemia. Um, heat stroke can affect all different types of organs in the body. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is the workup for these patients, which is a lot more extensive than I would have thought. So the workup for these patients, like I said before, was a lot broader than I would have expected. Um, heat stroke can cause all sorts of different types of end organ damage. So make sure your workup um, includes looking at every different type of organ in the body. So don't get a BMP, add a CMP so you can look at the liver. Always check the creatinine of these patients because they tend to be dehydrated and have AKIs. Add a lipase to them. Um, grab all the electrolytes, so that includes sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus. Um, their electrolytes tend to be all out of whack. Um, when we're talking about electrolytes, add an EKG. Make sure that's normal. Electrolytes aren't um, doing any weird arrhythmias to the heart. Um, if the patient is having any CNS-type symptoms, get a head CT because these patients are at risk for cerebral edema. Uh, they're also at risk for pulmonary edema, so if they're complaining of any shortness of breath, they're desatting, any chest pain, make sure you add a chest x-ray to evaluate for that as well. Um, and then some prognostic factors, you can get a PTINR, um, but also you want to get these things because heat stroke can cause DIC, so make sure you get your coags at the end of all of this as well. So the workup broadens when you have to rule out other things. Um, so if you're pretty sure it's heat stroke, sure, but you need to rule out any type of infectious causes. So you might need to add on a urinalysis, look for any skin changes, make sure you can rule out meningitis, um, and then rule out any endocrine causes like thyroid storm or pheochromocytoma. Um, or you can rule out any toxicologic causes. So get a urine drug strain on these patients. They could be going in to alcohol withdrawal, benzo withdrawal, um, 
And then lastly, definitely rule out neuroleptic melodic syndrome and serotonin syndrome. So just look at this, these patients' medications list and make sure they're not on any antidepressants or um, antipsychotics and make sure they haven't overdosed on them either. So when it comes to the treatment of heat stroke, um, the initial measures are going to be cooling the patient. So um, get a fan, get cooling spray, get ice packs, put the ice packs in their armpits, put it on their guangs, where their femoral pulse is, put it on the back of their neck. Um, and then these patients are usually dehydrated, so they usually have hypotension, give them some IV fluids. This is also going to help um, the AKI that they are probably going to have. And then um, if the patient has any cerebral edema or pulmonary edema, um, they might not be protecting their airway. They need to be, they probably need to be intubated fairly quickly. Um, and then for the electrolyte abnormalities, this could cause abnormal arrhythmias. So treat accordingly to the ACLS protocol and fix the electrolytes as soon as possible. And sometimes patients have seizures from the cerebral edema. So um, you can do short-acting benzos initially, and then you're going to want them on a midazolam drip thereafter. So that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I learned a lot about heat strokes from this one patient, so I thought it was a very interesting case, and I just wanted to share it with you guys. See you next week. Mm -hmm.